thanks to uh, the Metropolitan Library System and all of the staff, the great staff. So uh, Angel and Kobe and Megan, who, who are all here. Uh, who, these folks are the ones who actually make this happen. I just kind of show up and do my song and dance, and they do all the hard work. So definitely want to say thank you to them, uh, to Larry Nash White, the executive director of uh, the library system, who uh, helped make this thing start rolling down hill, so to speak. Uh, also want to thank uh, Dr. Jeannie Webb, uh, the president of Rose State College, uh, and Travis Harris, uh, the associate vice president at Rose, uh, Academic Affairs at Rose State, and then my boss, the Dean of Global Arts and Sciences, Dr. Uh, or Tony Castillo. Uh, all of them have been extremely supportive and given me lots of uh, 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 encouragement and room to, to do this kind of thing, and so I want to be very, very appreciative of them as well. All right, so last week, uh, if you weren't here, last week we discussed the uh, civil discourse and the importance of civil discourse to supporting democracy and how when we engage in polarizing, when we engage in divisive rhetoric, it leads us to make it difficult, uh, if not eventually impossible, to really support democratic governance as we've understood it. And so this week we're going to talk about civic participation, right? Uh, and those in my field, political science, uh, others, are constantly preaching, be involved, be engaged. And so we're gonna talk about how civic engagement supports democracy. We're also gonna talk about how, if we're not careful, it can undermine democracy as well. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about specific ways that you can be civically engaged, right? And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a little uh, preview, right? It's not all about political action. And so we're gonna talk about uh, that as well. All right, so when we think about civic participation, what do we think about? Well, we think about those actions and activities that help us become involved in the betterment of our communities, the betterment of our state, uh, the betterment of our nation. And those can take a wide range of forms, right? But civic participation is activity, right? As a, and some of that activity may not feel like activity, but it is an activity. It's doing something. Uh, and, uh, and so we're going to talk about that doing something and, and what it does for democracy. I like to explain civic uh, participation is the lifeblood of democracy. Why do we say that? Because it's what makes democracy feel legitimate. Right? It's what makes it feel like it is real, because we have a voice and we have the ability to take action. Uh, a lot of times we forget the importance of uh, the First Amendment in doing that, right? The First Amendment, we all know, the First Amendment protects our freedom of speech, right? It allows us to say what we want to say, but it also has some other protections that are equally important, if not more so, to actually civic participation. Uh, the right to assembly, which uh, we might today say the right of association, the ability to form with other people and take collective action, whether that's through an interest group, a political party, or some other group, right? We can come together with people who think like we think and act on something outside, we'll talk about this term civil society here a little bit, outside of, like we said last week, the, the coercion of the state, of the government, and outside of the transactional nature of markets, right? Uh, that space that we like to call civil society. Uh, and so, but the First Amendment protects our ability to do that. It protects our ability to communicate with our government officials and not be afraid that they are going to take action against us because they don't like what we're going to say, right? Now, often we think of that as the First Amendment, but there's another one that says freedom to petition government for a redress of grievances, right? Uh, in other words, that's not just, oh, we can sign petitions. That's, no, I can go see my government official and say, I think you should do this, and I don't have to be afraid that I'm going to be locked up later, right? Uh, I'm going to use a word that a lot of people don't like, but that portion of the First Amendment actually protects an important activity called lobbying, right? Lobbying is 
our direct communication to government officials, trying to persuade them to take action on our behalf, right? And the First Amendment guarantees our ability to do that as well. So civic participation bolsters, and, and, and we teach this, we teach this in our classes, uh, we talk about this out in forums like this, it bolsters democracy, our, our attachment to it, our understanding of how it works for us. Now, civic engagement exists, right? And I've taken this from uh, the United States Institute on Peace. It has a nice, long, little thing talking about civic participation. Uh, but it says, civic engagement exists when citizens have equal access to information and freedom of expression, right? Now, equal access to information is a little hard to come by, right? Uh, I don't know that any of us have complete equal access to information, although it is much broader today than it has ever been, right? Uh, I have more information at my fingertips than anybody in the history of the planet had ever had in any other generation. Right? Uh, so it is much broader. Now, in countries that uh, are not democratic, that's not so much the case, right? They control, tightly control the information try to prohibit you from getting information that would undermine the regime. Now listen, democratic regimes are, are in the same way, so it's not just that we have access to information, right, and freedom of expression, but civic participation also exists when you have an independent media, right, a media that is not controlled by the government, so that even though the government is going to have, every elected official is going to have their message they're trying to communicate, Government agencies are going to have their messages they're trying to communicate. Uh, but the independent media allows us to get other information from other sources to verify that information that the government's providing. Again, in more totalitarian or authoritarian regimes, you don't have that, right? You don't have that independent media. You have a media that is owned by the government, directed by the government, and only provides the information the government wants to exist. Civic engagement also exists when citizens have the means to actively engage in the public square. What does that mean? Well, that means I can, I can go to a protest. As I said, I can call my elected official and, and tell them, here's what I think you should do about X. Or I can make an appointment and go see that official. I can run for office if I choose to run for office. I can join clubs and organizations uh, that really aren't political in nature at all but are designed to improve my community in some way. We'll talk about those more here in a minute, right? But that's what we mean when we're saying that they have actively engaged in the public square. We have the ability, uh, without being controlled, without being told what to do by the government, uh, we have the ability to take action to change the environment that we're in, in some way, shape, or form. Also, civic engagement exists when civil society is empowered and protected and accountable. Now, what do we mean by civil society then? It's all of those that space that lies between government and markets, right? So, examples might be Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, Chambers of Commerce, interfaith organizations, and other religious organizations, charitable organizations such as the Salvation Army or the American Red Cross, these types of organizations that rely on uh, not just the generosity of financing from the public, but also rely upon the generosity of their time and in their effort and their, their willingness to do work on behalf of whatever that charitable organization is doing. All of these places in that area of civil society rely on the voluntary cooperation uh, that is needed to get stuff done that Quite frankly, neither governments or markets are very good at doing. Uh, and so, uh, and it's that, so if you remember from last week, it is that social cooperation which is essential to the sustaining of democracy, right? Uh, why, if you look at places where the United States has uh, actively tried to create democracies where they have not existed before, our track record isn't very good. Uh, and, uh, and there's a reason for that, because absent the social trust and social cooperation pre-existing a formal democratic process, 
we don't trust each other other with that process. We don't trust each other that you're not going to try to abuse this democratic process to and somehow put me at a disadvantage to compare to you. Right? Uh, and so this is why in civil society is the place where that social trust and social cooperation is built. Right? Far more than it is built in either governmental systems or market systems. Civic engagement also exists when or supports democracy when these things are present, right? When citizens have the opportunity to create change. Now, change is not, it doesn't matter what system you're in, change is usually not rapid. At least, it's not rapid like we're used to getting rapid stuff, right? I can call, uh, or call, I can get on the line and get an Uber at my house within 10 minutes, right? I can uh, order food and have it delivered in 20 minutes. Uh, I can stick something in the microwave and have it eaten in, and you can tell I haven't had dinner yet. I want everything's about food tonight. Uh, uh, but I can stick something in the microwave and have it done in four minutes, okay? Um, uh, we're used in our society to getting things very, very quickly. But guess what? When it comes to political things, it doesn't happen quickly. And in fact, our system is designed for it not to happen quickly. Uh, and the fact that it's designed that way, but our culture is so much designed to get stuff instantaneously, causes some friction, causes some conflict. Uh, it also supports democracy when citizens believe that they can take action to impact the community. I might have the freedom to take action, I might have the ability to, but if I don't believe that it will actually make a difference, it's not much different in outcome than if I didn't have that freedom. Right? If I'm not, if I don't believe that I can by uh, joining this organization or by voting for this candidate or campaigning for a, a candidate or a cause that I believe in, that I can change outcomes, then I'm not likely to engage in that. And we see that, quite frankly, in our politics today. A lot of people uh, simply do not believe that they can enact change. And let me tell you, what those people are doing is allowing others to make change that they want, and the rest of us who are sitting on the sidelines don't get what we want. Uh, and so uh, it is important that not only do we have the ability, but we have the belief that I can do something to alter outcomes, right? Now, it doesn't have to be big, but let me give you one example. Right, of change. Now, you're going to listen to this example and you say, oh, that was a long time ago, but the point is still relevant and the reality is it's still possible. So, how many amendments do we have to the Constitution? Does anybody know? 27. 27, very good. If you were in my class, you would get extra credit. <laughs> right. So, 27 amendments. The last amendment was ratified when? 1992, I believe. 91, 92, all right? That amendment says that if Congress votes itself a pay raise, all right, that's kind of a sweet deal. How many of you would like to be able to just say, you know what, I think I want a pay raise, and you get it, right? Yeah. So, so the 27th amendment says if Congress votes itself a pay raise, uh, before that pay raise can take effect, an election has to occur. In other words, they have to be willing to stand before voters and say, yes, we voted ourselves a pay raise, and justify that, all right? Now, guess when that amendment was introduced in Congress? You want to take a guess? 80s? That's a good question, yes. Incorrect, but it is a good guess. It was introduced, what's that? I'll say 70s. 70s, that's another good guess, right? You're only off by about 200 years. It was the 1790s. This was originally part of the Bill of Rights. Right? It was moved with those amendments. It did not get ratified, but it also did not have a termination date. It didn't say, like some amendments, if you look at them, they'll say if this isn't ratified in X number of years, then it's no longer in effect. Right? But this one didn't have that. A young college student, take note for you folks, 
a young college student, grad student at the University of Texas, is doing uh, research for a, a history class, I believe. Stumbles across this amendment, finds that it hasn't been ratified, but it has no expiration date, and says, I think this could happen. And writes a paper saying, I think this would get ratified, and I think it could be. Right? By the way, he got a C on that paper. <laughs> the professor was like, you're out of your mind. That would never happen. But then, lo and behold, he launches a campaign, and by the early 90s, we have the 27th Amendment. That's one person who's a student who took action and changed our Constitution because of it. Right? By the way, a few years ago, they retroactively changed his grade on his paper. <laughs> I'm sure that meant a whole lot to him. All right, but that's what we're talking about. We have to have the belief that we can, not just the opportunity to do so. It supports democracy when our civic knowledge is increased by the participation, right? There are ways I can participate, and I can get a very distorted view of the process, right? That doesn't lend itself to support of that democratic process, okay? There are ways where I can uh, be involved in very divisive activities. I can be involved in very uh, uh, polarizing activities. And that only leads to a more cynicism about the democratic process. So, or I can just not increase my knowledge of how things work. Right? I might have a, a misunderstanding of how the process actually works. Uh, I see a lot of that uh, in relation to political campaigns. Uh, how people uh, think that they run versus how they really run, and even if someone has done a little volunteering on a campaign, uh, they might not know as much about how that process works as if they were deeply involved with it. Uh, it supports democracy when government officials are responsive to citizen demands. Now, be careful here. Being responsive doesn't mean giving in, all right? But it means they are addressing those concerns, right? Now, I know this is going to be, it's like, no, democracy is if we want it, we get it. I'm going to challenge you to go and read Federalist Paper Number 10 and read James Madison's description of representation. Okay. Madison, and, and listen, they were not anti, it, it wasn't like, and the reality is if I'm a representative of some sort and I keep voting in a way opposite the majority of my constituents, I'm not going to be their representative for very long. Okay? That's a practical reality. Right? But what Madison said was, real representation looks beyond the immediate demand and takes into consideration what is going to be in the long-term interest of the community, the state, the nation. Right? And the immediate demand might be at crosswise with the long-term interests. And Madison said a real representative will recognize that. Right? That means they might be willing to risk not getting elected again. Right? How many of you think of elected officials in that way? There are, most of us think they're never going to take a stand that will risk their re-election. Right? Uh, and unfortunately, that's probably true because they want to be reelected, right? Uh, but but representation doesn't mean just always saying, "Well, this is what the majority wants, therefore I'm going to give it to them." <coughs> All groups are viewed as having the equal right. I think this is very important, right? It's the civic engagement supports democracy when all groups are viewed as having equal right to communicate their viewpoints publicly and to expect government officials to respond to their expectations. In other words, uh, I may think this, and I'm going to communicate to this. My elected officials, I want you to do this. But somebody else might disagree with me. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to do the same thing, right? And I have to respect that if I'm going to be able to do this, I have to understand that somebody else is going to be able to do it who might disagree with me, right? Part of what we see today, and remember this is an erosion of that, that commitment to democratic governance, is too many people, they want the ability to communicate what they want, but they want to shut out the ability of others to communicate what they want. Right? 
That's not democracy. Okay? Uh, and it's not a way that engenders a commitment to democratic governance. All right, a warning. As I mentioned earlier, civic participation can lead to the undermining of democratic governance. How? We talked about this quite a bit last week, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot, but I am going to give you a little bit more information than what I did last week. So, there are three things that I teach in my classes, every political scientist I know teaches in their classes, three things that a lot of people, historians and such say, uh, you need to be engaged, you need to be informed, you need to know what's going on, right? Consume the news. You need to be active, you need to vote, you need to support a political party, you need to help people get elected, you need to be active in political participation, and we say you need to be educated, you need to know how the system works, all right? And we constantly are saying, these are the things that make democracy work, but yet, if you remember, we talked about that more in common survey and the emergence of the perception gap, right? Those who were the most high consumers of news had the most distorted opinions about their political opponents, right? They misunderstood them much more than those who did not consume as much. And in fact, the group who had the least distorted perspective uh, people who disagreed with them politically were people who didn't consume news at all. Right? And if you remember last week, the only news platform that was shown to have a reduction in that perception gap was National Network Television News, right? ABC, NBC, CBS. Okay. Political participation can also create distorted views. In that same study, they found that those who were the most politically active and the most ideologically committed to their parties were also the ones who most misunderstood their political opponents. Right. Who had a distorted perspective of those opponents. Finally, education. And this is, this is a really interesting one, right? We tend to think of education as ameliorating some of these problems. And if we just know more, we'll, we'll be better suited to engage and we won't have these misunderstandings. What we found with Republicans, education had no real effect on how they perceived their political opponents. All right? If you look at the graph, what you would see is uh, 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 at the far end where they did not have a high school education or only had a high school education among Republicans, those were the most, uh, had the most distorted view. It drops down until you get about to uh, two years of college and it starts slightly, goes back up, but it never gets past that, that high school level, right? But overall, it remains relatively consistent. So you can say, well, it didn't do it any harm, but it also didn't do it much good, right? The, the perception, right? With Democrats, it's, you see a different graph. With Democrats, what you see is at every level of a, a increased education that is attained, they have a greater distorted perspective of their political power. Interesting stuff, and we don't have time to go in and to delve into all of that. Uh, the authors uh, make the case of that study that part of that is due to uh, the circles that these were, that basically they make the argument that uh, the higher educated Democrats become, the fewer non Democrats in their social circles. And therefore, they don't they come into contact with, with them as much. Right? All right. As we talked about last week, these distorted perceptions lead to increased distrust and dislike, right? That affective polarization that we talked about last week, we talked about the Pew Research Center's study on that. That leads to separation, right? So uh, a couple of researchers, Brown and Enos, did a, fan, a fascinating study. They took all 180 million registered voters in the country, geographically mapped them out, delved down to the neighborhood level. And what they found was, even within the same neighborhood, Democrats and Republicans generally had no contact with people who don't think like them politically. Right? We are, we hear a lot about segregation in different forms. Today, perhaps the single greatest 
mechanism for segregation is political identity. They can live in the same city, they can live in the same neighborhood, and never cross paths. That separation leads to the erosion of that social cooperation that we talked about, which then undermines the democratic alliance. So, how do we do this? So, what's the answer to this? Well, let me tell you, the answer isn't staying ignorant, not being engaged, and not paying attention to what's going on. That's not the answer, okay? Uh, and so I want to make that clear. But how do we avoid those the dark side of participation? Well, I'm going to give you a few a few uh, recommendations here. Number one, don't be hyper hyperpartisan. In other words, support candidates because they best reflect your values and opinions, regardless of party. Okay? Don't justify the bad actions of your party but instead hold it accountable. We talked about that last week. Right? And focus on agreement across party lines. What is interesting is there is this huge polarization amongst attitudes. In other words, we don't like each other very much. Republicans and Democrats don't like each other very much. When you do surveys about public policy and what kind of policies they want, they're a lot closer together. Right? But we can't get to that point because we're too busy hating on each other. We're too busy thinking the absolute worst about one another. So focus on those areas of agreement. Okay? Another one is don't equate civic engagement with political engagement. Political engagement is one form of a broader activity called civic engagement, but it is not the only form of civic engagement, and it is often not the most important form. As I mentioned, organizations like Rotary, Lions, Ambucks, Kiwanis Clubs are all civic organizations that are focused on improving their communities, and they're not political. They're about putting aside those differences to improve their communities. Chambers of Commerce, as I mentioned, interfaith organizations. And even political organizations that take a bipartisan approach, right? such as the Bipartisan Policy Committee or the Renew Democracy Initiative, in which they are trying to expand their communication across party lines and party divisions. These are all worthwhile activities that support and build up that social trust that leads to that support of the democratic process. So don't equate civic engagement with political engagement. All right, well how do I, you might be thinking, I, this sounds good, but how do I become civically engaged? How do I know what I can do? I'm going to give you some simple, simple ideas. And the point is here, you shouldn't go out and try to do all of these at the same time. All right? That's going to be overwhelming. But you might find some of these like, you know what, I can do that. Right? I can do that. Okay? Get involved with a community organization, something that's involved in trying to improve your community, some of those organizations that I mentioned. Volunteer with a charitable organization. Right? Every charity I know needs volunteers for different stuff. Uh, find one that you're like, I can get behind this, and volunteer with them. Communicate with your public officials regularly, but remember the rules of civility, right? Remember that civil discourse will lead to greater understanding and will lead to uh, greater openness than hostile. I used to work for a member of Congress. I can tell you every day, we got multiple phone calls, and they went like this. That congressman is the worst congressman that we've ever had in our history. They're bad. I can't believe they voted for that. I'm never voting for them again. I'm going to tell all my family not to vote for them either. Okay? And our attitude was they probably didn't vote for them the first time. We didn't really lose anything. Okay? That kind of communication, not effective. I'm just going to say, it's not effective. What is effective? An email that says, here's a bill that's out here. I'm concerned about it for these reasons. I'd like to know your stance on it, right? And let them tell you that. Here's what's effective, calling up. Now, I have all the time, I have students, other people that I talk to who think of elected officials as these folks that live in a separate world than us. They are not approachable. They are not people that we can talk to. That is not true. And the more local the official, the more accessible they are. 
But even the folks out of the state legislature, call them up. I would like to meet with them. I'm their constituent. I have a concern I would like to express with them. And then express that concern in a positive way. You can share your voice, right? You can do that through writing a letter to the editor. Anybody ever done that before? Write a letter to the editor? Most of us, I know, most of you, especially the younger you are, the less likely you are to even know what that is. But, uh, some of us have written them before, right? What is that? Well, that's me sharing my opinion, and a newspaper publishes it, uh, and the readership of that newspaper get to see my opinion. I can write a, an opinion editorial, so I did that uh, this week. Uh, for those of you that are uh, familiar, with, there's a great uh, publication called uh, Nondoc, uh, and they published a commentary of mine yesterday uh, on this on this topic. So uh, you can go to nondoc.com and check that out. Uh, but uh, you can write that. You can create a blog. How much does it cost to create a blog? Zero, right? Now, the credibility that you bring to that matters, right? If you're just putting out stuff and people say that's not right, that's not correct, your voice is going to be diminished, right? But you can do that. You can join protests. And there are times, civic participation and civil discourse does not mean protests are unallowed, right? Uh, we have a long rich, distinct history of protest in the United States. Uh, they have been important in a variety of instances to our history. Uh, and we should not be trying to cut off build up the ability of people to join together and to shout their voice loud. Now, when that crosses the line, all right? Well, when does it cross the line? There are different opinions on that. I'm going to give you my opinion. As soon as that crowd that's sharing their voice attempts to harm someone else who disagrees with it, that's crossing the line. Right? But being loud, being vociferous, saying we demand action, that's fair. That's, that's what the First Amendment is there to protect. Right? You can become active in an interest group or a political party, and that's pretty easy to do nowadays. Right? Uh, even the political parties are looking for volunteers, they're looking for people who will support them, they're looking for people who will make phone calls and put signs together, all this kind of stuff for their candidates, interest group, you need people to help on doors. So there's a variety of things that you can do in this capacity as well. Find one that suits, that, that mirrors what you think, at least as close as possible, and get engaged with them. If you want the ultimate experience, run for office. People laughed at me when I said this last week, but I'm telling you, there's no better way to know what the people in your community think about a thing as to go to their door, knock on their door, and say, I'm running for office. What do you think? Tell me what you think. I want your help. Because let me tell you, they will tell you what they think. All right? uh, and there's no better way of, of learning that than doing that. Uh, you can, if you're not ready to run for office, you can volunteer for a candidate that you can really get behind. You can donate to a candidate. Right? Now, there are a lot of different motivations for running for office. We tend to think of, oh, if somebody's running for office, they must want to win. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people run for office to highlight an issue or a cause. I'm passionate about health care. I'm passionate about taxes. I'm passionate about gun control, whatever it is. right? I'm passionate about this. I don't think the leading candidate or candidates are paying enough attention. I want to bring this to the table, so I'm going to run for office. And winning is a secondary concern. It's getting that message out, forcing the other candidates in the race to pay attention to that message. Sometimes it's just to offer an alternative. I don't think anybody should get elected without having opposition. And I know I don't have an, a, a real chance of winning, but people should have an alternative on the ballot. And so I'm going to run. Okay. And then you can have the motivation is I want to run. Right? I want to run and I want to win. That requires a whole different level of investment that we don't have time to go into tonight, but it is certainly something that some of you should think about. Right? 
that you should think about it. Uh, and, and consider if that's something that would be good in your future. All right, why should I participate? Right? As we said, participation is a lifeblood of the democratic process. It makes it legitimate, it gives it meaning, right? It shows that yes, not only can I go and vote, but I can take other action to impact my community or my nation. That participation fosters the social cooperation down here. So think about what you can do, right? What can I do? What's one thing I can do and I can commit to taking a step to improve my community? And that might be just like the letter to the editor. That might be emailing my member of Congress or my state legislature or my city council. That might be uh, uh, going to a political event, going to um, uh, a precinct meeting. So all the parties, the two major parties, will have precinct meetings ever so often. These are the least attended political events in the, in the, in the country. Right? Very few people actually attend precinct meetings, but by attending that precinct meeting, doors open up to do other things. All right? So lots of different things that you can do. Think about what you might, might take on. What do I think will best, and it might not be political at all, right? Again, it might be becoming a member of my local chamber of commerce, joining the Rotary Club in my community, or the Lions Club. It might be volunteering for that uh, blood drive. It could be any of that. Right? Don't limit civic participation to just political participation. With that, I'll open it up to any questions, comments, complaints. Or compliments. I'll take them all. Yes? How can we do Oh, hold, hold on just a second. We've got a. Is that Esther? Oh, Deborah, how would you feel about running the microphone again? Is that okay? we got a volunteer. Go ahead. How do we get the message out to the masses to do something? I mean, how. It's hard. Let me tell you, it's hard. I, I wrote this op-ed talking about some of this stuff, um, uh, but not everybody reads that, right? And uh, it really is one step at a time, talking one conversation at a time. When you hear somebody complaining about something, you say, well, it, it, instead of joining in the complaining or saying, well, you just don't know what, say, well, what can we do to change that, right? Just turn the conversation a little bit. What do you think we could do to change that? Maybe we should write, you know, maybe they're complaining because uh, people keep running the stop sign in their neighborhood. Maybe we should write our city council person about that and, and see if we can get that something done, right? Uh, maybe uh, we should write our uh, state legislator. There's something going on in education and we think it should be changed. Maybe we should do more like them, right? Just ask. What, I think that's a great question and a great mechanism for taking kind of anger and turning it into positive action. What can we do to change this? And uh, I think if we can all get that question into our vocabulary a lot and, and keep asking it, we'll find that there's a lot that we can do. Right? And again, one person, 27th Amendment was the, <laughs> the end result, resulted from one student taking action. Right? One person can be the spark that ignites a fire. And, and, uh, and two people are going to light a bigger fire. So I think that's, that's the thing. Don't get down on them. Don't tell them, well, you need to quit complaining. Just, hey, what can we do to solve this problem? Okay. And I think I'm all about starting where we can start. You know, I'm not going to change the world. I'm not going to go to Washington, D.C. and convince them all that they need to start acting better. <laughs> I'd love to be able to, but that's not going to be reality. But in the circle that I work in, the circle that I live in and operate in, I can influence those people, right? And I think that's the approach we have to have. Not, oh look, everything's so bad all over the place. What can I do in the world that I live in and operate in to make a difference? And I think that's the attitude we have to have. Thank you. We got one over here, and then we'll come over there too. Over here. Right down here in the green shirt. With the old guy in the green shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to the old man. Uh, in in the last year, 
six months. There had been um, Bud Budweiser was taking uh -huh. had taken huge hits on uh -huh. their outreach to LGBTQ. Right. Uh, so has Target. There have been many um, <clears throat> effective attacks or whatever, uh, against the EDI uh -huh. programs. <clears throat> Kind of discuss what these businesses are doing because they're looking at the market mm -hmm. and they're saying we want to these this is a group we want to sell to uh -huh. and it didn't have anything to do with politics we were just trying to sell a product sure um, I I can't see businesses changing their behavior because of the political or the protest, mm -hmm. kind of discuss that friction because yeah, and that's think, not that's not new per se. That 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 pushback. Right? I remember a decade or two ago when we had uh, in, in the Oklahoma City area, and you had kind of a large influx of the Hispanic uh, community, uh, and business started putting up signage in Spanish and and doing other things, and people were, I can't believe you're doing that. And it wasn't. They were just saying, hey, these folks are here, they might not all speak English. They, they we have money. They, we have want money them to to, they we want them to buy our stuff too, right? Um, businesses are in a tricky situation right now, right? Because everything, and this is why, this is why I think we have to politics is important, but it's important in its box, right? You shouldn't see every activity that you engage in through a purely political lens. That is not healthy. It's not healthy for your mental health, it's not healthy for your relationships, uh, and it's not healthy in trying to get things accomplished, right? But today, too many organizations are encouraging us to view everything through a political lens, right? And I want to separate out, so there's, DEI is, is misunderstood and misrepresented on all sides. Uh, what some people say it means isn't the same thing that other people say it means. People on both sides are being a little dishonest about it. But let's put that to the side. Let's just deal with the and, question and, of... And you might define it. Right. So if you don't know DI, diversity, equity, inclusion, this is kind of the next step. Uh, I think a lot of people think of it as the next step in uh, broadening uh, affirmative... We used to think of affirmative action, right? Where we're going to broaden access to education, to employment opportunities more access to engaging with in the political life of the country, right? DI, uh, I think a lot of people think of it in those terms, a lot of people argue about it in those terms, uh, but it's not quite the same. And I don't want to get in too deep of a conversation about that because that could consume the rest of the time we have. But I'm just going to say um, there's plenty of room to disagree about whether or not DEI programs have been successful in their purpose, right? Uh, and there's research that says there may be some problems that they're not, they're not being as, they're not accomplishing what they're wanting to accomplish. Let's put that to the side. Let's talk about a business sees a market, they want to attract that market because they want them to buy their, right? Used to, we didn't care, right? Now, what did you have? You had this kind of, you had this backlash of people who didn't want Budweiser to create marketing to attract this group of people, right? Now, were some of those folks drinking Budweiser already? Sure, does it harm me if I drink Budweiser? Let's say I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat. Does it harm me as a Republican that you're a Democrat and you drink Budweiser too? No, it does not, right? But we've gotten to this place where if a business makes an effort to go after a target market, and let's be honest, that's one of the most controversial, the LGBTQ plus issues are some of the most controversial issues in the public right now. And every company is going to risk taking some type of backlash based on what it does. And I don't see how, how they avoid that, right? Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but about three weeks, that has been more than that, came four to, four to six weeks ago, uh, they had to shut down multiple targets in the Oklahoma City area, right? There was a, a, a bomb threat focused on what? On Target selling merchandise that uh, was uh, uh, trying to attract LGBTQ community. Right? Uh, and so uh, 
uh, businesses are in this tight spot, and it's a no-win situation that if I don't feel like you want my business, I'm likely to go somewhere else, right? Uh, but a lot of this is just driven by, we're all driven by this, this um, political perspective, right? Companies that don't do that take a backlash from those who think they should. We're going to boycott this company because they're not proactively marketing to us, right? Or they're not instituting a, a DI, DI program the way we think they should. Uh, and so I don't know how, I, I would hate to be a large company right now trying to figure out how to navigate this. Well, part of it is my perspective is that the people who argue against it really don't understand mm -hmm. how American market has changed. I mean, you, you cannot say, it is, I'm not going to sell to this. I don't, like you said, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, especially, you could say, I ain't going to deal with Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And then you could still <coughs> sell goods and make a profit. I, man, I don't know if you could do that now. And so I, I don't think that the people who are organizing this understand the perspective of business mm -hmm. because the American buying public has changed so dramatically in the last 30 years. And I think, uh, I think, um, and I want to get, we've got uh, a couple of people who want to get in uh, a question or a comment as well. I think, though, what we have to have the attitude, what we should have the attitude of, is I get back to, is this company providing a, a product that I want or need at a price that I'm accepting of? I'm going to buy it, and I don't care who else they market to, right? I think we would all be better off if we took that attitude. A lot of people are not going to. But left and right, there are people who will say, I'm not buying this company because it doesn't satisfy my political demands. I do not think that's healthy. I don't think that's healthy for our uh, the economic health of our country. I don't think that's healthy for the political health of our company. I don't think that's healthy for the personal health of our country. Uh, but I'm not going to convince everybody to stop doing that. And I'm, I think companies are going to start having to take, you know, there's a um, parody outfit that does some parody videos on this stuff, and they do a lot of Democrat, Republican stuff. And one of the things they bring out is, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you're a conservative, you're going to go to Chick-fil-A, uh, and you're going to gas your car up at Exxon. And if you're liberal, you're going to eat, you drink your, your drink at uh, Starbucks, and you're going to charge your charging station at home or whatever, right? Uh, and and unfortunately, that is increasingly becoming true. And, and, and it's not new that we've seen pushback, right? And I think it's healthy to have a long-term perspective on this thing, right? Uh, that's why, you know, one of the things I like teaching about the community college is I have a wide range of ages in my classes a lot of times. Uh, and uh, for the summer, I had a gentleman who was 60, 67 years old right, in my class. And he can bring a perspective and he can bring a historical knowledge that the 18 and 20 year olds don't have. Right? And I think there's value in thinking, okay, what have we seen happen in the past? And we've seen this before, it's going to be rough. And in 20 years, we'll be down the road and it'll be some other issue that we'll acquire that one. I think, <coughs> eventually, right? Uh, but yes, there is this disruption. There is a greater diversity in the population. Businesses want to go after people of diverse lives and they want to market to them. They want to increase the profit that they get uh, by doing so. Uh, and it's just right now we're in this weird space where that is politically charged. And I think we'll move through it. I just think it's going to take a little while. Um, and so we're here. Well, hold on. We got. Uh, sure. She's going to come your way, and then yeah. we'll come back to you, Jeff. I'm here. Yeah. Right, and you got one. Take this hat off. Come down to the young man in the black jacket, real quick. Who uh, I should remember his name, but I, it's been a few hours. That's him. Luke. Luke. I think. Um, so. In a time of such economic and social crises, uh, it seems that both sides of the political aisle agree that democracy in our government uh -huh. is starting to wane. You see on the right, drain the swamp, and on the left, uh, we hear the shouts of 
democracy being deserved. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose my question is, if both sides agree that power is shifting towards those in government governance, in what way can we use civic engagement to shift the power back in our favor if it is wielded by those in government uh -huh. so tightly? That's an excellent question. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to answer this in two parts because I think the first part is really important, okay? Uh, we have challenges. There is no doubt. There are lots of different challenges that we have. And I said last week, unfortunately, we have two political parties and a whole bunch of interest groups that want you to think it's worse than it has ever been in the history of our nation. That is not true. There's never been a better time to live than right now. On almost every level. There's never been a better time to live than right now. Right. right? And let me tell you, this is true if you want to look at, at social issues like racism, which has diminished significantly in just the last 50 years in this country. Does it mean it's gone? No. Does it, does it, mean, does it mean that we still don't have work to do? No. But we made a huge amount of progress just on that. We made a huge, if you look at the way we live, Right, living standards. Right, I you know I have people who I went to high school with. Man, the eighties were so great. I lived in the eighties. They weren't that great. Right, <laughs> they were nice. And I'm not. And listen, I'm a, I'm a child of the eighties. I have fond recollections of Ronald Reagan, all that stuff. But do I want to go back to the eighties? No way. Right, and I certainly don't want to go back to the fifties. All right. Uh, so no. There's, there's no time better to live than right now. But we have a media contingency. We have political parties and we have interest groups that in order to motivate you to take the action they want you to take, they've got to drive you. And the best driver of action is fear. The best driver of action is fear. Okay. All right, having said that, we do have problems. If you think, and I agree, the problem we have, the biggest problem is we have a disconnect. We do have a society that, though it has problems, is doing pretty well, but we have elected officials who don't talk that well, right? And they're all about stirring up fear, stoking fears, because they know if they can stoke enough people to be afraid and to join them and say, look, these folks are out here, they're going to harm you, if they get in power, you need to elect me. So they don't get in power and harm you. How do we deal with that? I'm going to go back. I'm going to sound like a broken record, right? A couple of things: get involved with organizations that are not political. Build that social, build your own social capital. Build that social trust that's needed. In political action, look for candidates that are going to present factual information that are not going to try to stoke your fears and support them. And if that means you can only find one candidate in an election cycle to support, that's it. These, these folks running for office don't automatically deserve your vote. And we shouldn't automatically just, well, that's, that's who the choices are. I guess I don't have to vote for one of these jokers. No. No. <laughs> Make them pay a price. Right? And let me be honest with you. The only way you're going to make them pay a price is if, if you're a Republican, you make Republicans behave better, and if you're a Democrat, you make Democrats behave better. If you're an independent, you're a little on the outside, right? But you can you can make them pay at the ballot box too by who you cast your votes for. Okay? Uh, and then find organizations that are serious about fixing the problems that you're concerned about and get, in touch, get involved with it, right? That's a whole bunch of stuff, but as I like to say, citizenship is not a spectator sport. Right? If you want good outcomes, you've got to take good action. And that action is going to be in how you vote, it's going to be in who you organize with and, and work with, and it's going to be how you build that social trust in your neck of the woods. Right? Uh, I can't give you a, this is, this is the big picture, if, you, if we just all do this, or if we just all vote for this person for president, please do not put your faith in anybody who's running for president. Okay? And I'm not saying, listen, I, I have to deal with this in my classes a lot. People are very cynical about politicians. I get that. Most people who run for office want to do the right thing. They want to serve their constituents. They want to make things better. All right? Does the system twist them and turn them and, and, and sometimes give them 
distorted per, uh, incentives to act in ways that we'd rather they not? Yeah, we can, right? We gotta fix that if we wanna fix the policy issues. We gotta do that. But at the end of the day, we do have some power, right? At the end of the day, they, people in Congress, people at the state legislature, the governor, whoever, they only get there because of us. They only get there because we give them the power to do the things they're doing. We can. I, 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 a lot of people were like, well, this person has millions of dollars. That a, a single dollar can't make me vote a certain way. Right? It may influence the perceptions that I create, but it can't make me vote in a certain way. And so I've got to, and, I, and I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to anybody else, I've got to say and consider who are these folks that I'm voting for, and are they contributing to a better community, or are they simply stoking fears so they can stay in office? And we all have to, to do that. Good question. Did you have a question also? I got a quick question. Quick question. We mentioned democracy a whole lot for our country. Are we a democracy or are we a representative republic? I, I hear this. Yeah, I on? see this all the time. You know, I have people, and, and I'm the one who said it too. We're not a democracy, right? We're a republic, right? Reality is we're a democratic republic. Okay, so what does that mean, right? Well, one thing it means is uh, when it comes to decision making at the governmental level, we all don't make all the decisions, right? We choose people to make decisions on our behalf, representation. So it, in the Federalist Papers at that time, when they're talking about the Republic, they're talking about representative democracy, right? But at the end of the day, how do we make decisions? We vote and the majority wins, right? Except for we have this lovely little thing called the Constitution. It says there are some decisions the majority can't make for everybody else, right? The majority can't tell me what religion I should belong to. Thank goodness. Right? The majority can't tell me what candidates I will or won't support for office. Right? The majority can't send the police into my home for no reason just to snoop through stuff to see if they can find something to arrest me. I know we can think of examples. We won't go down that road today. Uh, but for the most part, the Fourth Amendment says I need to think, right? So, so we have limitations. So that's what makes us a republic. Two things in my my book. I'll give you four things, right? Representation, right? Constitutionalism, federalism. Federalism is that division of power amongst multiple governments, right? We don't have one government that runs everything. Right? We have multiple governments, that, and it can be confusing sometimes. So federalism, representation, um, uh, constitutionalism, and then separation of powers, right? We don't want, and the reason it's hard to get stuff done is because we have a system that was designed to make it hard to get stuff done, right? Uh, that you have to have majorities in the House, a majority in the Senate, and a president willing to sign that bill. And you better hope that nobody sues and says that bill's unconstitutional and then it goes to the Supreme Court. It's hard. That's why 90 to 95 percent of all proposed laws that get introduced in Congress die. They don't go anywhere. It's a hard road to hoe. And uh, and I think on net we benefit from that, right? Imagine if it was easy to make laws. There's no shortage of people who want to tell you how you should live your life. They are willing to use the law to coerce you into doing it, right? And if it was easy to make laws, we'd be bumping into each other all the time. Right? So yeah. It is true. We are a constitutional republic. That means there are limitations on the ability of majorities to make decisions, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, most of the decisions that we make are made through that democratic process. Does that help explain that a little bit? Yeah, it helps explain it. You know, I explain it this way. So, our one man, one vote really works at the local level. Yeah. It really works there. That's at right. the federal level, it's a lot of electors, and that's my representation. So that's, that, that's how I divide it. So for the young guys and gals out here, you'll make your biggest endpoint at the local level. It's get involved right now. There's, there's elections going on. They're campaigning right now. Like you said, get involved with a campaign. Get involved with a local uh, uh, leader at your, at your council level, at your state level. At your school board. At your school board. Yeah. Uh, these folks are accountable for, to all of us. So that's where you get... The biggest bang for your buck is local. Don't walk away from that local constituency. Get you know, there. You know what elections have the lowest turnout? 
This is what we want to do. Everybody wants to vote for president, the official who's the most distant from you, <laughs> who you are never likely going to meet and have an audience with and tell them what you want. We're all going to vote for them. And we're going to stay home and sleep in or, you know, go go play out, out outside and go on the lake when elections for school board are up or mayor or city council are up, right? And those are the folks who directly impact their lives. I think Jack over here had a question and we got one down to the front row too. Oh, we have some online yeah, questions. Yeah. All right, let's uh, yeah, yeah. let's let Jack's been waiting, and then we'll get a, a couple of online questions, and we have down down in front of us. Actually, been passed to me. So ah, you're, you're uh, you got me that. Uh, so the first of several online questions. So sorry if we don't get to all of them, everyone um, that's watching online. But thank you for asking them. Uh, what is the best way to get equal access to information and to know that that information is accurate? Oh my gosh, and we talked about this a little bit, right? And the best way is to have multiple sources of information, right? Uh, so that what you get in one, you can verify somewhere else, right? Another good way is, if the headline is designed to stoke fear, encourage outrage, just scroll on by. You know, I scroll on by so much stuff because it's like, whatever is true in this is not enough true for me to take my time to look at it, right? So I try to avoid those things to try to stoke fear, stoke outrage, double, you know, verify if this source is saying this, or I go to this source and will it tell me the same thing, right? Now, everybody's gonna have a different take, right? You're not gonna have the exact same identical, but basic facts should be basic facts, right? If the president shows up in Cleveland and gives a speech on economic policy, uh, you know, and Three outlets are telling the president showed up and made this speech, and here's what they said. And you have another one out here saying the president went to the moon, and the president, did it. okay, you got an outlier, right? You got one that probably isn't accurate. So, verifying your stuff, finding those that after a while, you'll begin to see how accurate are these folks, like how accurate do they, or uh, uh, is the information they're providing, and you can make judgment. You know, Judgment. And there are, listen, there are, there are outlets out there that are, are more credible than others. Uh, we talked about some of those, right? Uh, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, both of those are very credible outlets. Uh, here in the state, some really good ones. Uh, uh, you've got Non I've mentioned, you've got uh, Oklahoma Watch, you've got Read Frontier. They all focus on state stuff. They're not, they're not going to repeat a lot of stuff that's happening at the national level, but if you want to know what's going on in Oklahoma, all three of those. Uh, are good sources, and as I said, you can kind of see are they are they telling the same story a little bit, right? So that that would be my recommendation: is don't don't accept one source as authoritative. Admit that sometimes somebody's going to get something wrong. We're reporters are not computers; they don't know everything, and they're not perfect. They're going to miss some things too. Allow for that, and just understand. I, I can't just take oh this one. The New York Times is all I'm going to read. You're probably going to have a distorted picture of what's going on. Uh, National Review, that's all I'm going to read. We're going to have a distorted picture of what's going on. All right. Do we want to do another? All right, let's do Jack real quick. Over here. Raise your hand, Jack. What do you recommend? to young voters to help distinguish who to vote for. Ah, all right, do your homework, all right? And doing your homework doesn't mean watching campaign ads. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us, look, I, I look at campaign ads a lot differently than most people do, right? Um, uh, but, um, but do your homework, find out what they think, go to their websites, let them tell you what they think, Right? Uh, there's nothing, there's no better source than the person who's running for office and asking for your vote. Here's what I think. If they're already elected, check out their voting record. How did they vote on issues that are important to them? That's all public record, you can find that out. Right? That's a lot of work, and so you, you might not be able to do that for every candidate. Right? So think about the elections that you want to influence the most. Think about the elections that are most meaningful to you, and spend some time Remember, citizenship is not a spectator sport. It's sport. Spend some time uh, looking them up and and ask them. Right, all of these folks that are running for office, they're going to have social media. Uh, they're going to have emails. Ask them. 
What do you think about X? Whatever is important to you, ask them and let them tell you. That's a great way of finding out what they think. Right? Yeah, for the last couple of elections, the day of Oklahoma has had a blurb about each one of the candidates for almost every office mm -hmm. around. So if you don't take the day of Oklahoma, you can probably get Check check it out before the election because they they yeah the the, the, the they they got free from the library the Oklahoma okay there you go right <laughs> so yeah, if you're not uh, if you are not uh, if you're not a subscriber you can come to your local library and get that that edition of the, the Oklahoma and that's right the Oklahoma usually does do a, a good job of saying here's the candidates running for office here's what watch my watch too but I know they take yeah. Yeah, you're right. The name of the does do that. Let's come over here, Deborah, down front row. And then we're going to probably have to wrap up. This is great questions, guys. Thank you so much for all these, these wonderful questions. With the expansion of digital media being uh -huh. the uh, form in which that we tend to engage in this modern day and age, uh, what effect do you think that that's had on our lack of civil engagement and, you know, our kind of how it's all been to a vicious cycle of broken window theory versus, um, you know, lack of community engagement. Yeah, um, so you're really asking, you know, what role does the media play in this, right? I think it plays a huge role. Um, I'm gonna give, uh, again, a more traditional media, a little bit better grade than some of the newer media. And I think social media has been, has been on, on the whole less positive than we would have liked it to be. Again, you can get a lot of information on social media, but, but a lot of it is not good. And a lot of what's driven there is very much fear-based, outrage-based, right? In fact, uh, two, three years ago, there was a big story how Facebook algorithms were all designed to manufacture outrage, right? The more intense the emotion you had, the more those algorithms were going to push that stuff out to you, right? Uh, the more, you know, if I, if I lean conservative and I click on this thing, those algorithms are going to push me more and more to the extremes of conservative. Same thing as by leaning liberal or progressive, it's going to push me more and more to the extremes of those. That's the way those algorithms were built. Uh, uh, and so I think social media is, is an issue that, um, that we've got to figure out how to deal with it. I'm not one who says I necessarily want folks in Congress playing around telling me what should be going on on social media. Think, I get a lot of this, the government should do something, all right? Think about the politician that you dislike the most and ask yourself, is that the person I want regulating Facebook, Twitter, whatever, all right? Because uh, my answer is no, <laughs> not at all. Uh, and, and so, but we as people have to figure that out some too, how we use it, what we allow it to do, where we allow it to take us, right? We got one final question here. The time is up. No, you're good. Go ahead. So, just one of the comments on equal access to knowledge. Uh -huh. It's impossible, uh, it, and it's not a given. And I think that uh, one of the most important things, at least for me or anyone else, else uh, the information that they produce to empower themselves is understanding why it's divided. I mean, we have information that's contained in different social classes and different industries that are contained in sectors for reasons. If we uh, begin to understand why knowledge is in different places and how it travels and where the limitation is. I think that the desire to travel within those pathways can, can become more of a level playing field and then that access can become more equal. There has to be a desire on the individual level or the group level to actually do the traveling and, and figuring out where that information is because uh, equal access to knowledge. Uh, and you can't do that because we are all we all live in, in different worlds, right? Um, I don't know what goes into uh, your business and what, what drives the decisions that you make, right? I only know the outcomes of that, right? Uh, and, and quite frankly, I don't want to know. It's enough for me to know, here's what you do, here's what you're going to charge me to do it, and then I can make a judgment as whether or not, A, that's worth it. Sometimes I can only make that judgment until after you do it, right? Uh, and, and, I, and I figure that out. but. Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of knowledge that is dispersed and segmented, and that's what, um, I don't get too far down this road, I could be here a long time, uh, 
Uh, I don't want to go down too far this road, but that's what uh, markets do, is they move knowledge around in ways that we don't have to know everything. We just have to know what immediately is going to impact us, right? And the decisions that we make and what drives those decisions, right? But knowledge is moved around. I'm going to put another shameless plug for the library system. Libraries are very important to helping broaden access to knowledge, right? Not just through books, but through internet access and other things. So, uh, and that's, a, and listen, the libraries are this kind of weird intermediate institution, right? They're not market institutions. They're government in the sense that they're funded, but they're not really government all, entirely, right? And so they're in this weird space. Uh, but they're the kind, we need some of these institutions that help equalize access to information. We're never going to have the same information, but access to information. Uh, and libraries play a hugely important role for that as well. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anybody else before we get out of here? We ran 15 minutes longer than we should have. You guys have been great. I appreciate these fantastic questions. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up. You guys have a wonderful evening. Grab some more pizza if you're here and take some with you. Whatever.